you're watching Radioactive right here on YouTube. My name is Victoria. With me right now, I'm joined by Chris Kelly. How are you doing, Chris? How's it going? I'm doing all right. I'm doing great. I'm very excited to have you on the show today. And to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about you, except for the fact that you're involved in quite a few different musical projects, whether it's with Ice Nine Kills, your other band Huxley, and to my understanding, you also do some producing work. So I just kind of want to start by talking about your involvement with Ice Nine Kills. Can you kind of tell me just how you joined that band and how that came about? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've known Ricky for the better part of a decade at this point. It might even, is it, has it been a decade yet? I don't think so. I don't think it's been quite that long, but it's close. Um, the, for the very first tour that I ever did was playing guitar for his old band uh, called The City Apocalypse. So we, we go back uh, a number of years. Um, he hit me up sometime in like, it was either 2018 or 2019, whenever JD left uh, to... Uh, to step in and I had tours lined up, uh, with my old bands. Um, so I wasn't able to do it. And then when they needed somebody this time around, which was what last fall, last August, I think it was when he reached out. Um, so yeah, it was just, but when they, when they needed somebody to step in at, at the last minute, uh, I was, uh, I was the one that he called and, you know, uh, fortunately everybody else was on board and I got the spot. Mm-hmm. And for you, how cool is it to be like touring with Ice Nine for possibly one of their best, you know, album cycles and touring cycles that they probably have had? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is the best album cycle that they've had, uh, for sure. Because um, I know that they weren't playing uh, the size rooms that they're playing now uh, pre-COVID. So um, things are definitely going very well. And it's just, it's yeah, it's cool to be a part of it. Uh, I enjoy everybody's company and uh, the shows have been uh, largely very successful. And, uh, you know, just, I, I'm just after, after, you know, the couple of years off that everybody had, I'm just happy to be, be working again, you know? So mm -hmm. all, it's all good vibes. Yeah. And for obviously welcome to Horrorwood and the silver screams, it's all based around horror movies. So how do you like the imagery of the band? Do you kind of enjoy that cool imagery that they have going on? Yeah, I mean, I always appreciate a band that like understands, like has a direction, has a vision, uh, understands the parameters of that and, and you know, executes it properly, uh, which they definitely have at this point. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm a hired musician, right? So even if I hated the imagery, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's, uh, yeah. the band is what it is and it's successful for a reason. So, um, you know, I do, uh, I do enjoy what they've done, but I, uh, that's not a, that's not a requirement for me to work for somebody, you know? It's yeah, just, for sure. Uh, well, as long as, as long as things are going well, there's not much I can really complain about. Yeah. And as far as either the band itself or even the crew members involved with Ice Nine Kills, what's your favorite part of just being around that band and touring with them? I mean, it's, it's the it's the same as any other gig, really, in terms of, you know, what you what there is to enjoy about it. You know, it's just, uh, you know, obviously being a hired gun for a living, you know, the hope is always that whatever camp you're with is uh one that you know can sustain itself and everybody gets along in and uh you know that's re really just having chemistry with everybody is is the is often the biggest hurdle so that was uh you know taken care of pretty quickly um which i think is part of the reason why i've ended up sticking around for uh as long <laughs> for this long um is just because everybody kind of kind of got along right away and um you know, there haven't, uh, haven't been any, any issues between anybody really. So, uh, it's just been, you know, we've all been able to just sort of have a good time and focus on, uh, doing our best at the shows and, um, you know, playing our best and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, like I said, that's really, that's really all I can hope for in any gig. Yeah. And as far as the set list goes, what is your favorite song to play on the set? Uh, that de that depends. Uh, it kind of changes, uh, you know, because we'll like if we add a song into the set, you know, that could quickly become your favorite. But then after you play it for six or eight weeks straight, uh, you can kind of get sick of it. So, mm -hmm. but consistently, shower scene has been has been a favorite. Worst vacation has been a favorite. Um, 
I always liked playing Grave Mistake, even though we didn't have that in the uh, in the the Trinity of Terror set list. Um, but I mainly just like playing that one because it's an easy one and I get to do a nice big solo at the end of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, usually I think shower, because shower scene, I, I do a, actually shower scene and worth vacation. I do a lot of vocals in both of those songs and that those, that typically tends to be where the fun is for me. Cause you know, uh, I've been playing guitar and guitar solos in every gig for my entire life. So that's really nothing new, you know? So being right. able to, to sing is, uh, definitely uh, a big a big plus Mm -hmm. and a while ago you guys opened for metallica how cool is that just because you know it's metallica so had to have been pretty cool sure yeah it kind of goes without saying like i don't really know that there would be anybody on earth who would except for i believe modest mouse i don't think they were too happy when they played metallica's festival if i remember correctly but apart from them uh i don't think there's many bands on earth that would uh you know play a stadium for 60,000 people and be like ah what a bummer you know so um and i mean as as a bunch of metal dudes uh you know metallica is kind of what got so many of us into this genre of music to begin with so that's a big deal as well um so definitely a bucket list uh, you know, a, a bucket list item that was ticked for that. And, you know, we get to do it again in a couple of weeks. So that's mm-hmm. pretty sick too. So that's uh, not, so, you know, something that's sort of weird to, to like look back on or look forward to in, it really at all is just, just to be able to be like, Oh yeah, we're doing that again. Yeah. You know? Um, so, you know, because I, I honestly didn't think that there would ever come a time where I would play with or near Metallica even once. So yeah. that's uh, pretty mm-hmm. cool. And other than Metallica, is there any other bands that you haven't played with yet that you just absolutely love to play with? Well, Slipknot's one of them. And we're, gonna, we're about to go out with them in the fall, too. So a bunch of bucket list items just getting mm-hmm. checked off. Uh, but... Uh, Lamb of God was uh, was a big favorite of mine growing up, so I'd love to 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 do a tour with them, uh, whether it's with Ink or anybody else. Um, and uh, Ghost, Ghost is a big one. I don't know if you can hear the screaming baby in the background, but use him. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Ghost is another big one. I'm a a big fan of uh, of that band and just bands with massive production value in general. Mm-hmm. So they kind of boxes for me. So that's another one. Yeah. Now getting into the Trinity of Terror tour, that was like a crazy tour. You guys were touring with Black Veil Brides and Motionless and White. How crazy was that mm-hmm. tour? Because lots of the shows seemed absolutely crazy. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was crazy in both positive and negative ways. Uh, you know, on paper, the tour was a very successful one, uh, which is why we're doing more shows for it now. Um, logistically, there was just a lot that ever uh, all the bands dealt with a lot i mean black Veil had to drop off the tour for a little bit because a bunch of them got covid uh chris motionless had to had to not do a show because um something got messed up with his his throat or his voice or something and um he had to like i think he had to fly to see a doctor if i remember correctly don't quote me on that but uh, he definitely had to see a doctor and like get himself sorted out um we had all kinds of bus issues. I think we went through three buses on that tour. Um, and, uh, you know, just that I, I don't think I'm not going to say it's the only tour ever because that would probably that there's no way that's true. But I mean, I guess it could be, which would be nuts. But um, I've never seen a triple headliner before, you know, yeah. Um So for anybody watching who doesn't understand what that means, the headliner is typically the band that closes the show. And sometimes there will be co-headliners in which there are two bands that are billed the same way. Like if you look at the poster, it's like the names are the same size basically. And, and, and they'll often take turns closing that closing out the shows or whatever that, you know, that's something that the booking agents sort of sort of figure out. But um, in this case, we had three of those and we all rotated uh, every night so the schedule wasn't the same t- two days in a row um, which for the bands you know not all that's not all that much is different aside from when you go on stage but for the crew I know that's really all, all of the crew uh, that can get really difficult um, just because there's 
it's hard it's harder to get into a rhythm with stuff yeah. um and uh you know because it's a triple headliner that means that all three bands have full production and uh, you know whereas uh, i'm sure just about anybody who's been to a show notices that like the bands who open the show typically set their stuff up in front of the last band stuff and everything just kind of gets taken away until all that's left is the, is the headliners gear so in this case that's not really an option i mean it, like you know obviously the drum kits had to come on and off and whatever but uh but you know we were all using the same size drum riser and we're all using video wall and lighting packages and all that kind of stuff and we tried to consolidate as much of that possibly could but just you know inherently there's always going to be some logistical uh issues that come up there but i mean as far as uh you know how well the, the shows sold and you know what people did in merch and all that kind of stuff that was all pretty wildly successful so um you know overall a net positive but it was and it was like a two-month tour so mm -hmm. it was just, it, it did get to a point where a lot of us were pretty burnt out by the yeah. end of it I, my voice was shot. I had never, that had never happened to me before where I had like, wasn't able to sing for a couple of shows or, um, and I, and I didn't fully get my voice back until probably like a month after that. Um, it was just, uh, it, it was a lot, uh, physically. So, um, yeah, a lot of positives and, uh, you know, some negatives, but, uh, but overall a, a good experience. Mm -hmm. And do you have any like favorite moments or favorite shows that you can pinpoint that just stood out to you and stuck with you? Yeah, I mean, um, Philly was a big one for me because I'm from Pennsylvania. So, you know, I'm from eastern Pennsylvania. So Philly is my, you know, kind of uh, home base. And, uh, you know, I, I only wish that was one of the shows where my voice wasn't 100 percent. So had had my voice been solid that day that would have been like a 10 out of 10 show uh but if, you know i was just kind of focused on the the vocal issues um buffalo was amazing la was amazing uh edmonton i believe was the was the canadian show we did a couple of shows in canada but i think edmonton was the one that was like insane <laughs> was and, that was that one uh, oh oh that was the one you were at yeah. awesome that was a fantastic that was the one where there were the two sets of bleachers yeah in the back yeah okay um yeah that was killer and uh there was one more i think it was fargo i think it was fargo north dakota which is not a a city that you you would usually expect someone to be like yeah fargo fucking rules you know <laughs> but but no it was it was a good time the, the the venue was really big it was basically like a like like you would have rodeos there <laughs> uh and uh, that was one of the nights where obviously this part is unfortunate, but the, the, where Blackville wasn't playing that show. Um, so, and we closed that night. And so we got to play a few more songs that we didn't usually play in the set. Um, so that was, that was fun. And it was just one of those, one of those nights where everything clicked and, you know, everyone, everyone played really well and had a good time and, you know, no, no real like glaring issues or anything like that. It was just like, you know, you're like, you're, you're in the moment and nothing takes you out of it until it's over, you know, yeah. which is not always when you're, when you're performing. Mm -hmm. And going into the second part of Trinity of Terror Tour coming up in August, September, whenever you guys are going on the road for that. Yeah, I think, I think the first, I think the first show is August 30th when we yeah. win that one off within this moment in Colorado. Right. So what are you looking forward to going into the second part of the Trinity of Terror Tour the most? I, I honestly probably that Red Rock show uh, that we start <laughs> that we started with um, just because like this is not a, uh, it's not a negative thing really but it's just that like we've already done this tour you know what I mean yeah. so like aside like aside from being in cities that we weren't in the first time around it's not really going to be much different for us as the like from a band perspective i don't really think i mean i'm sure the set lists will change and obviously motionless just put out a new record uh so they're going to be having uh, a bunch of new songs and stuff so that'll be cool to hear and i think crown it's crown the empo um you know excited to hang out with, with them uh but as far as as far as the tour itself it's just like it's like it never stopped you know what i mean yeah. so it's not there's not really like oh like i wait for this thing you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm excited for Metallica and then and then the Red Rock show. And then when we go out with Slipknot, 
and then Trinity is just in between all of that stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, so but, you know, that's a good, uh, that's a very good, um, the, the phrase I was going to use is problem to have. It's not a problem, but I'm just saying we're like, we're like this awesome tour with these three big headliners is like technically the smallest thing that any of us are doing <laughs> in five months, you know? Yeah. And on this run, I don't know if you guys are hitting any different stops, but is there a show that you're looking forward to most? I don't remember what the routing is, so I can't really say for sure. I'm always excited to do shows in California. I don't know if we're doing any shows in California on this run or this this uh, this leg, uh, but I'm always I'm always excited to go in or near the West Coast. Uh, but uh, yeah, I can't I can't really say that there's one show that's jumping out at me just because I don't remember mm -hmm. them all. Uh, well, Scranton should be fun. Scranton, PA, because that's that's not like a that's not a major market, but that's rel that's about an hour from me. I just took my my wife and my daughter up there to see Hailstorm a couple nights ago, um, and we're playing at that same venue, which is a which is a, a big one. Um, so that that should be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, as aside from that, I don't really remember what the stops are. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned before, you are also part of a band called Huxley. Can you just tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about this project that you're in? Yeah. So um, fun fact, I, I'm actually not in Huxley anymore. Um, that's a very recent, that's a very recent development. Um, this is not some big deal announcement. Um, the band is still very much a thing. I, I started with them as a producer. Yeah. Um, I ended up becoming just more involved uh, in the songwriting and, and, um, and, you know, eventually being a member of the band and, um, just because it was it was something to like I, obviously i really liked working with those guys and uh, and i believed and still believe in what they're doing and um and it was it was scratching a, a musical itch that uh that you know ice nine wasn't you know um and uh you know just being able to play some some rock music you know and and uh you know be a little less just laser focused on what my hands are doing because mm -hmm. you know Ice Nine is complicated stuff. The the biggest gig I had before Ice Nine uh, was a, an inter, a, a band from another country that I can't say for legal uh, reasons, but anyone can Google it and find out who I played for. Um, uh, and it's not, you know, I should say, it's a legal reason sounds ominous. There's no, there's no problem. It's just that I wore a mask uh, in that band. So, um, but uh, so I've played uh i've been playing pretty complicated stuff for a while uh and my the band that i've been in since high school it's this band called illustrium which is like a technical death metal band so that's when i write stuff for that band that's like apps that's like pushing to the absolute limit of what i'm able to do and sometimes going above that and i have to then learn how to how to play it and whatever so most of my life has been playing complicated metal music so huxley was was a, a fun project to do because i was able to just focus on like writing what i thought was a good song and uh, and not really worrying about like oh well like this riff isn't you know blistering like so um <clears throat> but yeah so uh like i said huxley is is very much uh still doing their things to you know they're still gonna be playing shows and putting music out and there's a bunch of stuff that we had um kind of in the tank uh that uh that they all still have and will be coming out fairly soon um or you know over you know over the next several months so uh it's not going to slow them down because to, to to be honest uh apart from you know helping put the songs together over the last year i haven't really been all that involved i've played like one or two shows that huxley has done just because i've been on the road with with ink all year so uh you know that was uh it, it just got it, it got to a point where I just started realizing that I was like, I might end up holding them back. Right. Uh, because I'm away so much. And like, you know, they've already we I already I, I designed it so that they would be able to be completely self-sufficient and play shows without me. And so it's like, OK, well, if that's mostly what they're going to be doing, then they might as well just do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah. Great band. Everybody go listen to them, follow them, all that kind of stuff. I'm just no longer a part of it. That's all. Yeah. And now getting into a bit of like you doing some producing, how did you get into kind of wanting to do producing work? And when did you start learning how to do that? So I started, I, I had to have been 
15, 16. Cause I wasn't, I don't, I don't think I was driving yet, but I took forever to get my license. I was just really busy about it. So, um, so I was, I was probably around 16. Um, and I got into it pretty much for the same reason that I think a lot, a lot of dudes get into it, which was just to be able to, um, save i like musical ideas and try to develop them beyond uh you know what you're able to do just sitting with with one instrument um and the guy that i was i was taking lessons i had started up lessons again um because i had stopped for a while and uh i was i ended up taking what basically became songwriting lessons from this guy named pete baltus who who uh played bass for this band from the eighties called accept. Um, if anybody's ever heard a song called balls to the wall, there was like a big, uh, like eighties metal hit. Um, and he was in that band for decades and he just, he lives like, well, it's further from where I am now, but he lives like a half an hour from where I grew up and, uh, just ended up, he just was teaching lessons, but when accept was, they, they, they have, uh, you know, a number of years where they weren't touring and, um, and he was a co-owner of this music shop, like this lesson studio in, in PA. And I ended up just talking with him for a while and doing these songwriting lessons. And, um, and then, you know, we, we would kind of trade ideas back and forth. And then he brought me to his house and showed me his recording rig and was like, this is the kind of stuff that you got to do. And, was uh was able to get my parents on board with it of like you got to get them a mac and you got to get them pro tools and you got to get whatever and uh and so that's that's where it started and and i mean everything since then has just been uh so i mean i obviously i take clients and stuff you know nowadays and have been doing so for a while but um but it all it was all just to uh facilitate you know putting my own ideas down and being able to being able to put like you know make and release music without having to pay somebody else to do it basically right and for you was a music related career like the only option for you and interest that you had yeah um the only reason so i I did go to college i went to college for audio engineering for recording stuff and the only reason that i did that is because i grew up i I grew up in in a privileged suburban household so uh it was everyone goes to college that's you know that's what you do and uh and i knew that it there would be you know a a fucking war in my house if i was like i don't want to go to college so i was like i'll just go for audio because i didn't want to go for music uh and i i'll i'll i could i could give some bullshit about like because you don't need theory man but the fact of the matter is i never learned theory because i was lazy um and i didn't want to devote my entire college experience to doing the thing that bored me about music. I wish, I wish I knew theory. I really do. It would be a really good thing for me to have uh, in my back pocket to help me. Um, luckily I have a, a good ear. So i that's how I learn all the songs that, that bands hire me to play. And that's how I write stuff because I just figure out what's in my head. Um, so fortunately I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm endowed with, with ears that work, but, um, but theory would be nice to have. I just never bothered learning it. Um, so I didn't want to go for music and, uh, and I, so I went to this place called the art Institute, which used to be a nationwide college thing. Um, but it was a for-profit Institute and it is now gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so I got a fake degree (laughs) and, um, uh, but it would, but yeah, I mean, the, the career in music was, was always, I mean, since I was 10 years old, um, people have asked me who made me want to play guitar and I am not joking when I say it was Lindsay Lohan and Freaky Friday. Um, I watched that movie when I was 10 years old. She had a sparkly red Telecaster and her and her little punk band were playing a song in their garage. And I was like, I want to make whatever that sound is. And, uh, and from then on, it was just tunnel vision. So, uh, you know, absolute laser focus, no, no backup plan. Uh, because to me, uh, plan B, like having a plan B was accepting failure basically to me. Um, and, uh, you know, 
I, I went to college and I, I had to do an, I had to do internships for college and through one of those internships ended up meeting uh, two guys named Grant and Carson who run a, a studio in Lancaster called Atrium Audio. And uh, the, the three of us wound up starting my band Galactic Empire together, which ended up being my first you know, like musical career really, um, where I was actually touring for a living and, you know, yeah, I was wearing a fucking Darth Vader suit while I was doing it. So it was ridiculous, but, uh, it was still a lot of fun and, um, you know, got to do a whole bunch of, you know, huge shows and, and stuff that I never would have been able to do otherwise. And ultimately it's what opened all the doors to what my music career is now. So, uh, so somehow college ended up getting me a touring career in a, in a, round, a roundabout way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, absolute like laser focus on music stuff, you know, from age 10. Mm -hmm. And for you, how rewarding is it just to be able to be a pro musician and be making a living off of it? Cause lots of people, try to do it but they it just doesn't work out sure yeah i mean uh i definitely recognize like look obviously there's hard work that goes into it right like uh no pro professional musician uh as much as uh, contrary to what uh, certain people will say about bands they don't like um there is no professional musician that didn't bust their ass to get where they're at um but at the same time uh a lot of, there's a lot of luck involved yeah. um, a lot of sort of maybe not luck but i'll say right place right time right um like the 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 band the, the band that i cannot name that i played with uh before the pandemic hit um i ended up playing for them because my star wars band wound up opening for them in japan you know so like things like that um where it's just like you and, and like that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gone to college and gotten an internship. You know what I mean? So like a lot of it is just like you sort of just fall into this shit um, and you just got to kind of let it happen as it's going to happen. Uh, but uh, it's definitely uh, I definitely I recognize that like it could have gone a, a very different way and um, not a lot of people get to do this. And like all of that is very positive stuff. I will say, I mean, that, but there, there are, there are things of it that make it very difficult. I mean, I, I'm, I'm married. I have two kids. And uh, by the end of this year, I will have been away for roughly eight months of this year. Um, so that's not always the most conducive thing to, to having a family. You know what I mean? A lot of the, most of the dudes uh, or, or chicks that, <laughs> that do this, most, most people in this line of work are not people with spouses and children. Um, until they're already big and established and they, you know, all the shine down guys have kids and, and whatever, not all of them, I guess, but some of the shine down guys have kids and they're married and all that kind of stuff um, because they can just, they can do, they can make it all work together now because they have the finances to facilitate that. Um, I do okay <laughs> doing what I do, but I'm not in shine down, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, so it's not, it's, it's not always the most glamorous thing. Um, but I do still, you know, I do still love what I do and, and I, I do feel very fortunate that, uh, you know, I mean, whether it continues for the rest of my life or whether it all comes crashing down tomorrow, um, I feel very fortunate that I got the chance to do all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So thanks for coming on the show today, Chris. I really appreciate it. Yeah, totally. Thanks for having me.